Good morning, everyone. Is this microphone working? Yes, it is. Good. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan to this uh, today's press conference. I'm um, Anthony Rowley. I'm a former president of the club, and it's my pleasure to act as moderator today. Um, the subject of today's press conference, as you will have seen, is the G20 and the future of the global economy. I think that's a very appropriate title because um, the way that events are going to unfold at the uh, G20 leaders' summit in Osaka this weekend, I think, is likely to have a strong bearing on the health of the global economy over the next few years. Obviously, uh, you know, trade frictions have dominated the headlines recently, and it's, in this regard, I think the expected meeting in Osaka between President Donald Trump and China's President Xi Jinping is likely to be of very great importance. Um, but of course, the G20 summits are not just about crisis issues, or at least they're not supposed to be. They're often um, hijacked by crises, but there are many other very important uh, items on the agenda of the G20 leaders, uh, which are all critical to the health of the global economy, even if they're not so immediately attention-grabbing as trade wars. Okay, well, today, with the help of the Asian Development Bank Institute here in Tokyo, we've assembled a panel of five prominent experts uh, to give us a curtain raiser on the summit and to brief us on the issues which also range from the problem of global imbalances, the future of multilateralism, the changing shape of the global financial architecture, the digital economy, and infrastructure issues, and, uh, among others, and taxation issues too, all of which will be under the spotlight in Osaka. And as I said, we have a, a, a five speakers today and a very full agenda to work through in the space of just one hour. So I hope our guests will forgive me if I limit my introduction to one-liners for each person. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask the speakers today to keep to a maximum of three minutes each in their presentations, which is not an easy task, I know. So I'll introduce the speakers now in the order in which they will be speaking. Um, the first speaker will be uh, Mr. Naoyuki Yoshino, uh, the Dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute and Chair of the Think 20 or T20 uh, um, area of, of the G20. Um, next will be Mr. Dennis Hugh. Uh, Asia Pacific Economic um, Policy Support Unit, uh, uh, sorry, Director of the Asia Pacific Economic or APEC Policy Support uh, Unit Secretariat in Singapore. Following him will be Ms. Sayuri Shirai, who of course is a former Bank of Japan Policy Board member and now a Professor of Economics at Keio University here in Tokyo. She will be followed by Nella Hendrietti, who is Senior Capacity Building and Training Economist at the ADBI and former Deputy Director for G20 at the Finance Ministry in Indonesia. And last but of course not least is Bi Hong Huang, who is a Research Fellow at the ADBI and T20 Japan Policy Task Force Digital Development is her specialization. Okay, well, that's it. And But before I ask uh, Dean Yoshina to speak, could I ask you all please put your uh, mobile phones on, switch them off or put them on manner mode um, as a courtesy to our guests. So please join me in uh, welcoming our guests and then immediately after that, Dean Yoshino will give his comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming here this morning. Uh, I'm the Dean of ADB Institute. I would like to make six points in th three minutes. First one is uh, aging population is one of the topic in G20. And it turns out effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policy drastically declines as population is aging. That is what, is, what Japan is facing. So structural policy to make people work much longer and based on way, a marginal productivity of wage rate rather than seniority, wage rate is important. Second topic is infrastructure investment. I define quality infrastructure as how much each infrastructure affect the regions, development of the regions, income disparity should be mitigated, and so on. And currently, rate of return from infrastructures all rely on user charges which is very low. That's why private sectors are reluctant to make investment in, in infrastructure. 
So we are proposing spillover tax revenues should be returned to infrastructure investors, which can induce much more private sector investment into infrastructure. Third topic of G20 is SME, small and medium-sized enterprises. It's very important in Asian region, and they are difficult to borrow money from banks. And digital economy, the data analysis of SME is one of the ways to make them much easier to borrow money from banks. Secondly, hometown crowdfunding had been developed in Japan, which can collect money from individuals in the region. Fourth one is a related trade issue. I am always focusing on exchange rate mechanism of each Asian regions because trade is significantly affected by exchange rate system. In Asia, there are many different kinds of exchange rate system, and it is not uh, necessarily be market oriented. So exchange rate system should also be focused on. And last one is our environment, green bond. Currently, green bond has been started to be issued. However, real greenness is different from one green bond to another. So in other words, only purchasing green bond might distort the portfolio allocation of the uh, entire world. So I prefer tax on CO2 and other exhaustion gases may be better than green bond, unless greenness of green bond can be uh, defined. Last point is uh, future risks of many global economy will too much easy monetary policy in current situation. And when it has been started to be tightened, there may be some big crisis, which we experienced in 1997 and 1998. So monetary policy has to be somewhat be neutral rather than keep on going to easy monetary policy. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, absolutely on time. Uh, Mr. Hugh, please. Thank you. Um, since I come from APEC, and many members of APEC are members of the G20, I'd like to t talk a little bit about the economic outlook, uh, so, and perhaps on the trade issues as well. And uh, again, since uh, APEC chair this year is Chile, and I think the APEC chair will be attending the G20 leaders meeting end of this month, I think also, also talk a little bit about some of their priorities in Chile and how that uh, aligns with the G20. Uh, first of all, on the economic outlook, I think we all uh, quite agree that we are taking a very pessimistic outlook towards uh, growth uh, over the next one or two years. Um, the IMF, as you know, has downgraded their forecast for next year. I think it's about 3.3% from 3.6%. In APEC itself, we're forecasting uh, a growth of about 3.8% in 2020 compared to 4.1% this year. And we, we also know that one of the main reasons for that slowdown is because of, of uh, concerns of rising trade tensions and, and increase, in particularly in, in uh, different types of trade restrictive measures that have been implemented by a number of economies over the last one or two years. Um, we know that WTO itself has uh, looked at a slowdown in trade volume uh, looking at something like 3. Point, uh, sorry, 2.6 percent this year from uh, a little over 3 percent last year. So that, that trade momentum essentially is slowing down uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And that coincides, of course, with the increase in different types of uh, trade restrictive measures. In APEC alone, if you look at from mid-2017 to mid-2018, 60 percent of different types of trade-related measures are trade restrictive in nature. So I think there's some genuine concerns as we, as we move forward. There's a mix of downside risks to take into account as well, besides trade tensions. We we're looking at concerns on, on Brexit, a slowdown in, 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 in China in terms of their economy, and a, and a host of other things. So again, as we, as we move forward, I, I guess a G20 meeting will be very important, especially on discussion on in, in international trade. We'll see how the, uh, the growth forecast will be revised up or down uh, over the next year. 
Uh, just lastly, last point on APEC Chile, there's a lot of overlapping measures uh, and, and common uh, types of initiatives between APEC and G20. Chile is very in interested in looking at uh, issues related to women's empowerment, uh, uh, trying to introduce greater participation of women in the economy, in the private and public sector. Again, that's a major initiative at the G20. Looking at inclusion, I think we need to find ways to communicate better the benefits of globalization and integration that's discussed at G20, APEC, and others. How do we find that? And I think you increasingly you're looking at issues on, on inclusion and inclusive growth. These are some of the initiatives supporting uh, micro, small, medium enterprises. Again, is another important area at the G20 and at APEC. How do we help them to internationalize, get access to the, to the global markets and the digital economy? And lastly, I think there will be some discussions by the other panel speakers. How do we improve and get a, getting better access and opportunities in the digital economy, looking at barriers to to digital trade, what are the things that needs to be addressed, and finding that right balance for regulators, not to over-regulate, that would impede that, that increase in uh, trade in, in the online platforms. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Shirai, please. Yes. Um, I would like to focus on this T20 issue uh, from macroeconomic and uh, um, financial aspect. The first point is that the G20's uh, main theme was how to maintain a global economic expansion. And they acknowledge that economy is expanding, but uh, economic growth is remain low, and there is a significant downside risk. So how to cope with this downside risk? And then uh, G20 is saying that we should, if, if, at this moment, the monetary, um, monetary easing is continues to supporting the global economy. But if it's necessary, uh, each country should do more monetary easing together with flexible uh, fiscal policy. And so I think uh, what happened in US from this January this year, the sudden turnaround uh, in terms of monetary stance from more uh, um, to the more dovish stance really uh, changed the global landscape. And I think this uh, massive monetary easing is helping to helping to raise the stock prices. But uh, but the issue is uh, how much this monetary easing. Uh, will contribute to this global uncertainty, since this global uncertainty is uh, triggered by policy intention, right? It's such as um, um, the trade dispute, or I I Iran and US dispute. Those are all policy-induced uncertainty, so there are not much uh, monetary policy can do in this area. The second point is that G20 is not uh, focusing on the sort of distortion, the side eff effect, Created by created by monetary easing. So if we look at the balance sheet of uh, Fed and the ECB and Bank of Japan, the total balance sheet is 15 trillion US dollars. That is huge. We never experienced such kind of massive monetary easing uh, conducted by three biggest central banks in the world. So, but I think they have to talk about talk. Uh, what will be the implication of this 15 trillion US dollars in total? That certainly contributes to the uh, global low interest rate, right? So that generated corporate debt uh, in US, like M Mrs. Lagarde mentioned, and also uh, um, household debt and the bubble in a real estate. And so there is a risk created from there. But G20 is not able to discuss uh, you know, on this issue well. So that is the second point. And the third point is that, what is the difference between the currency depreciation created by direct intervention in foreign exchange market and the um, um, depreciation created as a result of massive monetary easing? I think Mr. Trump's remark is kind of related to this issue, right? So he recently mentioned that Mr. Draghi's uh, you know, uh, talk about further monetary easing, and he's saying this is uh, to uh, promote uh, euro's depreciation. So nowadays, I think it's becoming unclear about this uh, depre uh, exchange rate depreciation and uh, foreign exchange intervention and monetary easing. The third point is about aging. So aging means we need to have a sustainable pension and also insurance uh, asset. But what it means when we have a global low interest rate, especially advanced economy, if you look at the 10-year yield, Japan, Japan and Europe, 
it's a negative yield. And certainly, that contributes to the uh, um, you know, uh, low profitability and uh, a very low return. So it may uh, affect, uh, um, uh, it, must, it might affect adversely the sustainability of pension fund. That issue is not covered by G20. Finally, so G20 mentioned that we need to cope with the aging, so means we have to have a greater productivity. But as a result of massive monetary easing, such an extremely low interest rate, uh, you know, will let unviable company to survive, right? So it delay the corporate restructuring. So it contributes to the low productivity growth. So that issue is also not covered by G20, and I think they should. It's time for them to discuss uh, the concrete measure on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Andrea, to please. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I will talk about um, the evolution of G20. Maybe you will already know that G20 uh, in summit level was initiated as <clears throat> a result of a global financial crisis in 2008. The collaborati collaboration is quite successful in avoiding economic crisis at that time. The leaders at that time, I mean like 19 countries plus one, committed to avoid long financial crisis and saw the opportunity to work together to prepare the real threat for the global economy. And a lot of reform, at the time, reform is financial sector reform, IMF reform, international financial architecture. And aside from this uh, monetary banking and financial system reform, G after that, G20 also discussed many new issues, like Anthony always, already mentioned that tax issues. So that's, that's, uh, we can say that uh, tax transparency is quite successful with the automatic exchange information. And, and countries uh, start uh, exchange information since 2017. And now G20 uh, um, uh, formulate it's uh, in the process of formu formulating taxing in digital economy with um, uh, the, and using the concept of significant economic presence. And uh, there's also like climate change issue, digitalization, and last year in future uh, Argentina proposed a future of work. And this year there's new issues that um, uh, proposed by Japan like aging population. And you can see that every presidency has uh, promoted a new topic and that's endless discussion in G20. And currently, uh, uh, that's G20 covers um, very broad topics, and uh, uh, actually the goals of G20 is that uh, use all instrument, fiscal and monetary and structural reform to achieve strong, sustainable, and balanced, inclusive growth. Uh, and and maybe you already know that in Brisbane's summit, uh, G20 has committed to will improve uh, global growth by 2% in five years. So they're still working on that to, um, to achieve that, the additional 2% of global growth, um, uh, considering now we still have like downside risk, like um, uh, Shirai said. And uh, I will explain about the role of T20 here. Um, the role of T20 here is important to provide evidence-based policy to government and leaders of these inflation, influential countries in the world. Member of T20 coming from prominent researchers and academia uh, from developing and developing countries. Besides discussing the form and formulating policies in T20 meeting and forum, the T20 me members also discuss the topic and issue in T20 with policymakers in their own countries. Therefore, Think 20 group is not only suggesting policy recommendation, but also persuading their countries to pay attention and have, have more understanding about the priority issue in the world. So with this communication, they also can help policymakers to find the solution in line with their country specific and priorities, rather than just pres prescribing recommendation. Um, from my point of view, I have, I have two points, like can be challenge or opportunities. So first, uh, multilateralism. Um, in this summit, in this G20 uh, meeting, G20 should be able to address the challenge against multi, uh, uh, the challenge and multilateralism in order to foster cooperative internationalism when many countries now are looking at domestic and unilateral solution. Many countries have different views on the threat of between bilateral and multilateral mechanism. Defe as developing countries, Developing countries could see them as a complementary, since bilateral arrangements tend to be more costly and solutions sometimes are less than expected. 
expected. So G20 should find common interest among G20 members and formulate win-win solution in this current trade war and avoid more negative consequences toward global economic growth. As explained by Daniel that now there's a slowdown on trade volume in this last 12 months, I think leaders should aware, I mean, should, I mean, aware about that. And then second, the infrastructure. Uh, I, to achieve like two percent uh, additional two percent growth uh, for uh, in the world, uh, the economists find that uh, Im infrastructure is a, a driver of economic gr growth and prosperity. So, therefore, we, um, however, uh, it takes a while for countries to realize its benefit to econo the infrastructure benefit to economic growth, and it is still challenging to accelerate the development due to financing gap and lack of viability of infrastructure project. So, as um, uh, Din Yoshino mentioned, we have to find out uh, the solution for this. And uh, Hangzhou Summit in 2016 and Buenos Aires Summit. Um, have uh, many solutions, and now Japan presidency have a quality infrastructure, a high G20 high-level principle of quality infrastructure, and this hopefully this uh, principle can be a common strategic direction, direction and aspiration for uh, for countries to uh, implement a, a good quality of infrastructure investment. Instead. Thank you. Uh, now, Ms. Huang, please. Okay. Um, very good morning, everyone. Uh, as a researcher, uh, two of my research fields are closely related with the issues that I feel that G20 countries work closely, uh, work very closely to find the global solution. Uh, the first is is about uh, financial technology. So. Um, First, in the last one decade, we uh, observed the very rapid growth of financial technology uh, across different countries. And uh, um, on the benefit side, that uh, we found that uh, fintech has unfolded its dramatic power in terms of promoting the financial inclusion for the household and the SME, and also uh, it uh, help to dramatically reduce the transaction cost and improve the uh, financial efficiency. However, at the same time, um, this new financial technology also imposes new challenges for the existing uh, financial system. Uh, first, for example, the crypto assets as well as digital currency. Uh, they are new themes and uh, it could impose the new challenge for the central bank on how to uh, regulate them. And second, um, the fintech has imposed the direct risk on household and as well as SME. Uh, for example, in uh, under the new technology, it became easier for the household to borrow. So over that, uh, it became a new issue. So uh, in this perspective, we actually uh, prepared the policy brief on how to address this issue. One important solution is to promote digital financial uh, education to uh, educate the household and SME uh, in the new uh, fintech era. And uh, third, uh, the fintech will uh, also impose risk on the existing financial institution as well as banks. Uh, however, if we look at the macro prudential regulation, uh, most countries haven't addressed this new risk. Uh, so G20 countries uh, should work together to understand the new risk uh, coming from the fintech on existing um, existing financial system. And the last is, uh, we know nowadays fintech can um, operate across the borders. So, um, and usually um, we found that big fintech company are dominate the market. So uh, this involves the cross-border issue like taxation, uh, like regulation on the monopoly uh, fintech companies. Uh, in this perspective, G20 countries should work together. And the second field of my research is on the environmental finance. Uh, so we know now the uh, challenge imposed by the climate change is become uh, more and more significant and need to be uh, addressed as soon as possible. According to the scientific research, uh, the uh, but um, emissions should be reduced to like uh, uh, like zero by uh, 2050. So uh, my research is mainly uh, from the financial perspective. The climate change and the environmental uh, pollution will impose the risk on the financial system. Uh, first, uh, like say, a lot of uh, asset could be uh, exposed to the climate change. Um, say uh, some. Uh, assets could be used as the collateral. When they are destroyed by the climate change or pollution, this will impose the new risk on the financial system. And second, in the transition toward the low carbon economy, uh, this 
will also be very costly and uh, could impose the risk on the financial system. So the solution uh, for such kind of risk uh, could uh, come from three perspectives. First, uh, I feel that um, G20 countries should encourage the disclosure of emission and pollution, especially for the public companies. The first step is G20 countries should actually work together to set the disclosure standard. Uh, first step could come from the public companies. And second, uh, as I said, uh, climate change could impose the risk on the financial system. So this means uh, the financial regulation regulator as well as central bank should integrate such kind of new risk into their macro prudential regulation. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, thank you all very much and thank you for keeping to time. Obviously, there's an enormous amount of, to be discussed at this meeting and I think the ministers or the leaders are going to require at least a week to do justice to the... Um, could I, just before I open the floor to questions, could I just ask uh, Dean Yoshino and maybe any other speakers, Japan is the host country of the G20 this year. It's obviously very anxious to have a successful outcome to this summit meeting. So where do you think Japan is putting its priorities? Or what of the, which of these many issues do you think Japan is particularly anxious to see progress on um, this week, at the, at the meeting this week? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think one is that uh, Japan is focusing on infrastructure investment. And infrastructure is very important in the development. However, many countries rely on public sector finance, and also quality of infrastructure uh, is very important. So that is one of the uh, key issues. Second way is about the climate change, <coughs> and including ocean plastics and so on. So climate is another important thing. Third one is a universal health care, and that is the third issue. And last one is a uh, aging population which not only Japan, but also developing countries has to prepare for their pension system and so on when they are very young. And that, those are the four issues. Thank you. Okay, all right, well, then we'll open the floor to questions. As usual, please a working press first. Um, and as usual, identify yourself. And please uh, restrict yourself to one question initially. Yes, over there. Yes. Oh, and also say if your question is addressed to any particular individual, right? Sure. Uh, David McNeil for The Economist. Um, well, two people on the panel, I believe, have touched on pensions in Japan, the pension crisis. Sayuri Sensei, I think, was one. Yoshino Sensei was the other. Um, this is probably the biggest financial story in Japan this month, the shock report from the FSA that um, all people could need a $200,000 top-up. Uh, uh, on top of the public pension. Um, I wonder, as the host nation, if Japan has anything to tell the rest of the world about the problems face, it faces and the rest of the world faces uh, in providing for old people. Um, I'm very surprised that it isn't on the agenda. Um, so maybe if you could comment on that as well. Many thanks. Sure, I perhaps you would like to go on that one first. So I think uh, what government, uh, this report, I think was good, to be honest, because uh, people cannot, I mean, if people want to have a comfortable life, maintaining current uh, living standard, then the public pension is not enough. I think the report was try to suggest so people have to accumulate asset and try to get higher return through diversification of asset. So that was a message. But I guess uh, uh, um, because in Japan, you know, people just put most of the monies in the form of a bank deposit and uh, yield return is just zero percent. So I think uh, um, we need to have uh, more education about this, you know, asset returns and uh, accumulating um, post-retirement, uh, I mean, asset. So that was a message, but at the same time, I think because a lot of Japanese people are not really trusting the Japan's public pension system because every year the um, benefits are dropping. So people are not very worried about the pension system. So because of this worrisome, I think people took it, to be honest, I think misunderstood. So the message was people should be aware about uh, the uh, after retirement and try to save uh, you know, some amount from now and prepare for the future. That, that was a message. But at the same time, because people are really worried about future pension system, so people kind of 
um, uh, that this trust on the public pension system deteriorated. So maybe how to communicate uh, this issue is very, very sensitive. So that was a lesson I think uh, we can uh, get from uh, Japan's experience. Anyone, anyone else? Yes, uh, Dino so I'd like to add some comments. Japanese uh, longevity is one of the longest, and we are expecting many people live at the, until the age of 100. Then anybody knows pension is not enough. It was expected to 85, now it goes to 100. How could we do it? And Japanese asset management is one of the worst among OECD countries. In these 20 years, US asset increased 3.4 times. Japanese asset only increased 1.5. That is very difficult for elderly people. During Japanese high growth period, within 10 years, asset went almost twice for everybody, even the bank deposit. That's why everybody can afford it very well. So I think the one of the messages is how could we strengthen our asset management companies? Because they don't provide good products to everybody. Secondly, retail uh, financial institutions used to rely only on uh, charges, fees, rather than looking for rate of return. So I think for people who are investing into many market would be ne necessary not to put their money into deposit. So that is one message. How, to, how could we live until the age of 100? And secondly, structural reform is critically needed. As I mentioned in my first presentation, when the population is aging, effectiveness of monetary policy diminishes drastically. The intuitive reason is monetary policy affects the investment of the companies. So those who are working in the companies can receive higher wages, bonuses. But retired people are outside of the influence of monetary policy. And if the interest rate goes down, retired people rely on their accumulated assets. Then the rate of interest goes down. So it has a negative impact. And that population is strongly increasing. Then what should we do is the very easy answer is people should keep on working as long as possible. <laughs> and I'm just joking. If everybody in Japan works the day before we die, no problem will arise. <laughs> Pension system, yeah. But then why could we do that? Because we have seniority wage rate system. So elderly people receive higher wage rate compared, the, compared to their productivity. So we should change wage rate system as productivity based and to make people work as long as possible. That is the best solution. <laughs> okay, well, we'll come back to pensions perhaps later. Um, next question, please, uh, from the work. Yes, yes, please. Lady over there. Yes, yes, please. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Eika Kihara. I work for Reuters. I have a question for Ms. Sayuri uh, Shirai-san. Hello. Um, you made a very interesting point about the distinction between currency intervention and monetary easing. So um, I think ECB and BOJ in particular, the interest rates have become so low that the effect of monetary easing, the, the very few channel working could be weakening their currencies. So I wonder if um, in the future, would the ECB, BOJ, Fed really focus more on not directly saying they're going to affect currencies, but would they still focus on the currency channel in making monetary policy work? And what does that mean for G20? Because they agreed that they would refrain from competitive currency devaluation, and yet what monetary policy is doing could be kind of, yeah. you know, um, it, it could be pretty tricky line. So I wonder what that means for the G20. Thank you. So right now, I think there's a consensus in, in G20 that you know if the country is directly intervening in a foreign exchange market like China does occasionally, that's uh, if that is for the purpose of uh, gaining compet competi uh, competitiveness, that's bad. But if the central bank does. Uh, monetary easing uh, to meet their own mandate of 2% price stability target. Then each other country are, are not supposed to talk anything about, you know, uh, say Japan's monetary policy or ECB's monetary policy. I think that is a consensus. 
right? So direct intervention is not good, but if the depreciation created by monetary easing, nobody will talk. I think that is a consensus. But I think what I wanted to say is that, but if we look at the G3, and that created a huge balance sheet, right? and that's not the own country's problem. That affects on the global financial market, right? So at this moment, so like I said, there is a very simple uh, consensus among G G20, but probably uh, that's not enough. Right? If it affects on the global capital flow, like to Indonesia or other countries exchange rate, then I think this is not the each country's you know, price stability agenda. I think G20 have to talk about that. Um, so to be honest, there is a fine line um, between uh, depreciation created by um, you know, con um, direct intervention in the foreign exchange market and depreciation created by mon monetary easing. There is a fine line. So I don't know whether we can really com uh, can have a complete differentiation. Um, yes, Patrick. My name is Patrick Walter, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, German newspaper. Uh, I have a question to Yoshino san, mostly, I suppose. If you look to the G20, they seem to, uh, concerning the trade issues, they don't come to a uh, solution all can, can buy in. So there were definitely some kind of tensions between the US, China, and the rest of the G20. I wonder about the future of the G20. If one country like the US or like China is not really willing to play by the games or play by the rules, does this mean that the G20 is going to lose power and that they are going to lose importance for the world economy? And related to that, I wonder if you look back to the G8 meeting in Toyako Summit 10 years ago or 11 years ago, that was the start of the proliferation of G8 ministerial meetings G20 ministerial meetings, and now you have a lot of ministerial meetings, and I just wonder if the G20 are doing too much and if they should just focus on the world economy as their main goal. Okay, thank you. I think uh, right after Lehman crisis, G20 were focusing on only one issue, how to solve financial situations in the US. So whenever countries are looking for the same direction, then they can discuss each other. So global warming, climate change, those are the issues they can discuss. All, all the G20s can agree to discuss. But if it were trade, then one country is surplus, one country is in deficits. Then there's always a conflict between the two. So I think G20 would better focus much on globally uh, identical directions and then discuss it. Then if that keeps on going, then G20 will also be able to uh, sustain. And trade issues, Dennis Hugh is a uh, uh, specialist. He will talk about more about uh, those issues. But I think the important thing is we should look at that topics which we can all address in the same way. And that's a way to uh, have a good uh, concluding uh, remarks. That would mean not looking at trade policy. That would mean not looking at yeah, don't, don't, don't. Looking at no, no, and monetary policy, trade policy, we can look at it, but it's a much more global aspect rather than talking about one by one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. I, Please. I can, um, um, you know, G20 is established in the beginning because uh, there's a trust, there's a commitment from leaders to find a solution for the global. And currently, this is kind of like um, diverse. Um, so this, this will, I mean, kind of like a risk to G20 le legitimacy. So, uh, but I think uh, what G20 doing now that we find, a, like I'm saying before, find a common interest. So, I mean, there should be many aspects, maybe some aspect in the WTO reform can be discussed. I mean, but we, we should like uh, still consider like every country interest in this and then find a common solution like the said. Can, can, can I just add that, um, you know, in you talked about US-China trade tensions and, you know, in, talking to each other is good. Whether it's at G20, the G20 trade ministers met earlier this month. Uh, Many of the APEC trade ministers who also attend G20 
attended their meetings, trade ministers' meeting in Chile in May, a month earlier. So there's a lot of opportunities for US and China to, talk, to have bilateral discussions to try to resolve this. And, and you can see that. So I think to me, having these types of forums, uh, discussing these wide range of issues will be quite important if you want to resolve these tensions right now. Could I just follow that up, please, quickly, if I may? Um, I mean, we have a lot of trade disputes at the moment, and obviously the common factor is the United States, the United States and China, the United States and the European Union, the United States and Japan, all the trade tensions in each case. Um, in this situation, I mean, is the, uh, for, I, I think one thing that perhaps um, is interesting is that the RCEP, the Regional Common Economic Partnership Agreement, is possibly due to be uh, completed at the end of this year. Uh, and that doesn't include the United States, of course, it includes China and includes um, 15 other countries. So do you think there could be a, tendon, a trend towards you know, stressing the importance of regional trade agreements in order to lessen dependence on, on the United States. I just like opinions from whoever feels they want to comment on that. Um, yeah, it's not just RCEP. We also know about TPP, right? Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, announced that they were leaving the TPP, but I think thanks to Japan and also Australia, they were able to revive TPP, and now it's called CPTPP. I think it's Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and that excludes that this doesn't include the U.S., but it leaves it open. Yeah, it, one day perhaps the U.S. may continue to just so you have these proliferation of mega free trade agreements that's currently going on. And I think that helps, I think. Uh, we know that there is a slowdown in trade, there's increasing concerns of trade protectionis protectionisms, but having these types of regional trade agreements may help to give that, uh, that trade uh, liberalization a bit of a push as we move forward. Anyone else, any views on regional trade agreements? Whether the, if not, we'll pass on to the next question. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Richard Carter from AFP. Uh, maybe for Dr. Hugh, uh, following back up on trade policy. Um, I mean, obviously, you've talked about a lot of issues, but I think the main focus is going to be on the US-China trade talks, maybe on the sidelines of a summit. What uh, chance do you, do you give of there being a deal at this, at this summit? Uh, and can you just explain to us a little bit about the, the macroeconomic impact? You know, if, this, if these tensions continue, if US and China don't come to a deal, if tariffs are increased, what risk do you see for the global economy? Thank you. It's hard for me to predict. I hope they will come up with a deal, but I, I don't know. I mean, optimistically, may, maybe they would have some progress in their discussions. But uh, to make it very clear, I mean, this is bad for everyone. If you continue to have uh, rising tariffs, increase in different types of trade restricting, restrictive measures, it disrupts supply chains. It disrupts global production networks in this region. And what, what, what happens? Uh, rise in raw materials, production costs, and that ends up being passed on to the end consumer in terms of higher prices, consumer prices. We know what's keeping up growth, uh, aside from trade, is actually uh, private consumption. In fact, uh, if over the last couple of years, it's basically household consumption that's actually giving a bit of a buffer to that slowdown in trade performance. Uh, but if you're going to have higher prices, higher consumer prices, higher prices for services, then that's, gonna, that's going to have a, da a dampening effect on consumption, and th that would es essentially exacerbate uh, the slowdown if you move forward. So um, it's a no-win situation, frankly speaking. If I can add uh, about the macro aspects, I think uh, in the past, US, Europe, uh, major importer, and also GDP was uh, largely dependent on US and Europe. However, GDP in Asia is started to grow, and ASEAN 10 countries, India, and China. And if uh, trade among Asian countries keep on in free, then middle income class is growing in Asia. So traditionally, Asia used to export to US and Europe. But within Asian regions, the trade will become much, much more prosperous. And then that in macro, I think uh, Asia may become much, much stronger. Can I add something? Mm. So, uh, so if this protectionism continues, I mean, it's already happening from, la uh, from the second half of last year. So if you look at uh, uh, like Europe, uh, China, 
uh, Japan or um, and other countries, you know, manufacturing sectors like PMI is deteriorating. So clearly, this trade protectionism is already affecting the manufacturing sectors and deteriorating the manufacturing production um, and, and trade already. So that is clear. But on the other hand, if we look at non-manufacturing sector like services globally, it's still okay. I mean, this is same for uh, across the board. So why? It's because still uh, employment uh, is growing, so that is good. But at the same time, because of the low interest rate, right? Because of the massive monetary easing and the low interest policy is creating this demand for housing or like construction activities, commercial uh, real estate activities. So that is contributing to this non-manufacturing sectors. So again, this is also related to monetary policy. So for a moment, this massive monetary easing is really helping this services sector. And then, you know, so that's why we don't really feel serious uh, economic downtown at this moment yet. But in the longer run, what will be the implication of such kind of a heavy dependence on monetary policy? That is an issue you have to look at. Yeah, Eva, I, oh, sorry, I just want to add on, on the, in, we haven't talked about investments as well. Uh, if you look at the recent UNCTAD numbers, um, I think there's about a 19% drop in global uh, FDI flows in the global economy, if it, this 2018 numbers. Uh, it's quite significant. We look at uh, the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, we saw that drop in foreign direct investments globally. Uh, again, you know that's another area because there's a very, tr there's a very close relationship in this part of the world between trade and foreign investments. So you got all these downside risks and uncertainty, whether it's to do with higher tariffs. We've also got Brexit. That's all thrown into the mix of uncertainty, which means that multinationals will think twice before they want to increase their investments in this part of the world. Yeah, I can, if I can add one more. Uh, in this easy monetary policy affecting a lot for households. Uh, in many Asian countries, household debt are uh, significantly increasing. Uh, Korea, Thailand, and other countries. Japan also faced with household debt m problem about 15 years ago after the bubble. And I think four factors are important. One is debt to income ratio, and also expected growth of uh, their income, and number of years they borrow money, and interest rate, the level of interest rate. Those are the factors which determine whether house goes, household goes into debt uh, sustainable or debt explosion. So I think uh, I'm now working with the Thai Central Bank of Thailand to solve those issues, and many countries will face similar problem if easy monetary policy continues. Okay, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Kaori Hitomi from AP. Um, something a little bit concrete. Um, the plastic waste, plas plastic waste, as uh, you mentioned, is supposed to be one of the topics. And then we see some reports of some target Jap Japanese government is trying to achieve as a consensus of G20 nations. And over the weekend that we have seen ASEAN nation leaders came up with something similar to the message. But with this G20 member nations, which is much wider and possibly uh, including lots of producing countries as well, like what sort of target do you actually foresee to be in the vision? And also, do you think that will come to the agreement and how much of impact it could have on this global issue? Sorry, was your, your question addressed to any particular speaker? Or anyone? Ms. Wang, you haven't, Ms. Wang, you haven't spoken at all yet, if you'd like to have any comment. Um, um, I, I just want to um, 
um, uh, talk about the I mean the the broad uh, the umbrella policy of that. Um, so in in G20 we talk about the climate change and the target from no, uh, national determinant contribution, and then one of that I mean it's uh, like uh, how to manage the plastic waste. Um, um, I'm not sure how the the discussion uh, going with the target of the plastic waste, um, uh, but um, I think currently, uh, I think in the last two presidency, uh, the climate change issues a bit uh, is included in the sensitive area. So uh, G20 um, uh, now trying to find the consensus uh, for that. Um, uh, maybe for the uh, for the plastic waste, you can... Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the question. Um, um, yeah, maybe I can answer this question from uh, the general framework of how G20 countries should work together to deal with climate change and the pollution. So um, I think to handle the climate change and pollution it involves three factors. The first is technology. I mean, to reduce emission, reduce pollution, uh, we need new technology. And uh, uh, we see that actually in terms of technology in innovation, is quite promising. Recently, we see uh, quite a lot of new technology can help to uh, if effectively reduce the uh, reduce the pollution. So, a uh, second factor is actually uh, financial resources. How to mobilize the financial resources and also uh, provide financial incentives for the production sectors to adopt the clean production technology. Uh, that's something that G20 countries should work together. Okay. And the third is leadership. Uh, I mean, strong leadership is uh, very needed, given that the risk imposed by the climate change is uh, very, uh, very, uh, very big and very impressive. Uh, so uh, fortunately, we see in terms of financial perspective, uh, two years ago, uh, a network called Network for Greening the Financial System was established. So uh, under this network, um, more than 30 central banks and financial regulators uh, start to collaborate. Uh, hopefully, they may set some uh, disclosure uh, standard. I mean, like, say, uh, the platforms, at first step, uh, we should have a standard for them to disclose the emission, uh, including, like, uh, plastic waste, uh, so that uh, we know how to handle the issue and also will reduce the risk for the investors. Okay, and then uh, in terms of macro prudential issue, um, central banks should uh, work together to uh, reduce or moderate the potential climate change risk could impose on the climate uh, on the financial system. Okay, and uh, if I can add one about the theoretical perspective, and I think those plastics and other CO twos should be taxed properly. Then the rate of return or those those companies and the exposed. Tax, uh, tax deducted, rate of return goes down. Then financial investors try to invest to those sectors less compared to others. So I think uh, theoretically speaking, tax will be the best way to make the financial allocations more optimal. Interesting points, thank you. Um, if, um, if, if there isn't is, if there isn't an, um, another question immediately from floor, um, two of the speakers have uh, um, referred today to the, the risks of central banks competing, as it were, for over monetary easing. I mean, it all, I wouldn't call it a race to the bottom exactly, but where does this all end? I mean, does it all end in, in a great inflation at some point in time? I mean, you know, the, um, obviously that depends on, on demand, but uh, could currencies become so debased or debauched that they become not worth the paper they're written on? <laughs> and Dean Yoshino first, and then uh, uh, sure I yes. then, then the first I would like to talk about uh, bubble. I think 1997-1998 Asian crisis was uh, in 1996-1997 the massive monetary easing. Then in 1997 January there is a increase of interest rate that, that suddenly withdrew the money from Asia to outside. So I think uh, easy monetary policy, while it is used, it is very good. However, when it changed to the uh, uh, changes in monetary policy, it will also always affect significantly. Even now, there's a symptom. Japanese easy monetary policy, banks are receiving lots of deposits, so they have to make loans. And but they cannot buy government bonds because they are negative. And they, if, if they want to make loans, 
good companies, no need. It's already they have enough money. Then they are now trying to find out the places to put their money. And then real estate and housing are the easiest place because price is going up. Then many people started to borrow money to construct housing and so on. So I think a continuation of easy monetary policy will always go either in the bubble, in the real estate, housing market. Main reason is there is always demand can be created. But other sectors, we cannot create demand. And then uh, why we are not in inflation? Because I think in the short run, uh, in, and, and also aging population, consumption is diminished. So aggregate demand is slowed down. That's why the easy monetary policy is not encouraging so much demand. That's why price level is kept low. But if it continues, always we have a monetary MV or PY, money supply. If velocity is not so much changed, then either price level or real GDP will go up. So eventually it may create inflation. So this 15 trillion uh, US dollars created by Fed, ECB, and Bank of Japan, this is huge, right, uh, unprecedented. But yet, what is surprising is that these three cent central banks are not really successful in terms of achieving 2% uh, inflation targets sustainably. So why this is happening? Why we have a low inflation? One is, like uh, Yoshino Sensei said, uh, because of aging. Because aging means uh, less demand for housing and you know and, and the durable goods. And second, uh, it's because of uh, um, low wage. Uh, growth and low wage growth. Why why we have a low wage growth? It's partly because a shift from manufacturing sector to services oriented economy means low to produ pro low productivity growth. So wage growth is slow, and people do not expect higher uh, um, you know e uh, e uh, wage uh, wage in the future. So uh, we have a very uh, sluggish consumption. So what shall we do? So one way is we can uh, lower this two percent inflation target, but the Fed decided to take a different route. You know, what Fed is doing is Fed want to make sure that they get 2% in a stable manner. So they are now considering to, uh, to discussing uh, about how to strengthen their monetary policy framework. So they are thinking about introducing average inflation targeting, which is theoretically far more uh, um, um, you know, powerful than uh, current 2% inflation target. So if Fed is sticking to 2% for sure, then ECB and Bank of Japan have to follow it. <laughs> yeah, because if we don't follow it, we might have a, 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 a currency appreciation. So if Fed is sticking to that and going to lower the interest rate, maybe July or September this year, then uh, ECB and the uh, Bank of Japan have to do something more to uh, contain the uh, exchange rate appreciation. So this is a problem we are facing. So each central bank decides its own <coughs> policy to meet their own um, 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 price stability target. But the fact is that that is affecting global economy and global financial market, and we are not discussing about that. So that is an issue missing. <laughs> It's time for just, just one more quick question. Yes, Patrick. I wonder on this monetary issue that Shibai san and Yoshino san just brought up again. When you say this is there is a risk, what do you think should be done? Should we bring up interest rates right now? Okay. Okay. I think uh, US, Japan, Europe sit together. <laughs> too, too easy monetary policy will eventually create either bubble or high rate of inflation. But uh, while they are in power, they try to maintain the economy as good as possible. So that is why many central bankers and politicians prefer easy monetary policy. But the outcome is either in the big bubble or high rate of inflation. So I think they sit together. We should, they should discuss we'd better make the monetary policy not so much easy, but structural reform is much more important. As I mentioned, Japanese case was the aging population is one with the biggest structural problem. So making the labor market much more flexible for uh, older, elderly people. So I think uh, monetary policy cannot solve those aging population. Uh, I, I met uh, Five years ago, Marvin King, when Marvin King was visiting Japan, I asked him, 
with a monetary policy can solve the aging population? His answer was, central bank cannot print babies. <laughs> so that was his answer. <laughs> so quickly, uh, there is one difference between Yoshino Sensei's view and my view. I think even continuation of this massive monetary easing, maybe we cannot get hyperinflation. So because inflation, low inflation is more structural nowadays. So that is a central bank house to look at. If despite the massive monetary easing, they haven't been able to generate 2% inflation, this means it's more structural. So I think it's time for central bankers and then monetary policy makers to discuss about, you know, well, you know achieving 2% is a really good thing for the each country. And also, we have to talk about side effect. I mean, maintaining 10-year yield at 0% is a really good thing. I mean, it may be not good for the pension fund, right? So it will undermine our, you know, um, our uh, anxi anxieties. So we have to talk about that. Well, I'm afraid we've, <coughs> excuse me, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, unfortunately. It's sort of passed all too quickly from my point of view. Um, let me thank all of our speakers for their very interesting contributions. Um, ito -san, ito -san, do we have um, um, certificates, uh, membership certificates? Uh, no, are, are we presenting? Are we presenting life uh, one year membership? Sorry, we'll send it. Oh, okay. Well, it's sorry. It's our custom here to oops to present uh, one year memberships, uh, honorary memberships of this club. Unfortunately, I, I don't have them with me, but they'll be sent to you. So, again, thank you all very much. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it, and we would have liked you to speak much more. So please come back again uh, at a future date. And thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.